Well, greetings everyone and welcome to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. The Law Hour is sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. I'm your narrator, George Gordon. The Law Hour and Editorial Review is heard nationally and internationally seven days a week here in the United States and in more than 120 countries worldwide daily over the Internet. Now, for more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, please visit our webpage at georgegordon.org. Again, that's georgegordon.org. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, business, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events. So stay tuned for tonight's special report on modern science and the Genesis record right after this. Hey, let me ask you a question. What do you think is wrong with the Ten Commandments? Because it's pretty obvious now that something is wrong with the Ten Commandments because they've been banned from our public schools, banned from our public institutions, and banned from our national consciousness. Now, instead of these ten simple time-tested laws, we see the ten planks to the Communist Manifesto taking their place, and they're teaching this ten planks to the Communist Manifesto in our public schools, in our public institutions, and we've made them a part of our national consciousness. You know, this is a pretty radical change in our political and moral outlook over the past 50 years. Are you aware, for instance, that your daughter couldn't receive an aspirin in your public school without your consent, but now she can have an abortion arranged through that same public school nurse without even your knowledge, much less your consent? That's why I contend that the solution to this kind of moral perversion and national insanity is to go back to what worked. Let's go back to the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law. You know, our founding fathers practiced, and they advocated the Ten Commandments, and they even put 22 principles of that law into our federal constitution. And there's still at least one school left in America that's teaching this entire Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments and all 759 statutes, judgments, and commandments, as well as the penalties and the 33 benefits that we all receive for observing that law. Now, you know every law has a penalty, and you don't have to know what the penalty is in order to suffer its effect. So whether we call this the Mosaic Law, the Law of God, the Common Law, Natural Law, Karma, or something else, it's automatic, and it works just like AIDS, herpes, and VD, which just happen to be the natural penalties for adultery. Now, if you'd like more information, why don't you call and order our free general law CD package first. That's the place to start. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a four-hour commentary on the law in general, and it's educational, it's informative, it's entertaining, and it's free of charge. And you can call and order one right now. The number to call is 417-273-4967. Once more, that's area code 417-273-4967. Now, if you're online, you can go to our website, georgegordon.org, <clears throat> georgegordon.org. Just click onto the archives page, and you can download that free general law CD package right there. Again, that's georgegordon.org, and go to the archives page. Hey, we've been talking about <clears throat> modern science and the Genesis record from the perspective of Genesis 1 and 2 and the scientific application or implications of those two chapters. The book is called Modern Science and the Genesis Record. It was written back in 1945 by Harry Rimmer. That's the way you find it. You go into a used bookstore, tell them you want Harry Rimmer's book on modern science and the Genesis Record, published in 1945. It was originally published in 1937. The 13th edition was published in 1945. Give them that information, they'll plug it into their computer, and they'll find you a copy somewhere in the world. And there's a second place over here, probably a better place, would be bravenewbookstore.com, because I think they probably have it stocked. Oftentimes what happens is that you take a popular old-timey book like this, and some publisher somewhere will pick it up once the copyright runs out, and they'll publish it. So there's probably somebody somewhere publishing this book right now, brand new, right hot off the press. And you can get that from bravenewbookstore.com if that's in case the fact 
and their telephone number is 512-480-2503. Now once more, that's in uh, Austin, Texas, 512-480-2503. Now today, the last program here in the series, I want to take up a little uh, different part of the subject here. I've got 13 scientific events that have transpired here on planet Earth over the last four or five thousand years that demonstrate the veracity of Genesis 1 and 2 in opposition to evolutionary philosophy. They are the sun is shrinking, oil deposit pressure, interplanetary dust, juvenile water, erosion, topsoil, Niagara Falls, igneous crustal buildup, trees, population studies, the magnetic field, dissolved minerals in the ocean, and atmospheric helium. There are 13 studies that we can do to demonstrate the veracity of Genesis 1 and 2, and that is the Earth is relatively young. Remember, evolutionary philosophy, the backbone of the theory, the backbone of the hypothesis, the story goes back billions and billions of years, as Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions of years ago. Now, the truth of the matter is the Earth is relatively young. It's under 10,000 years old, 10,000 years and these disciplines, these scientific studies, demonstrate that. And nobody ever tells you that story. So let me show you story number one. The sun is shrinking. That was a Newswire report of March 23, 1980, and it was made in the news media. That is, the above ground, standard news media. I mean, this, is, this isn't being hidden away in some conspiratorial yellow journal sheet someplace. I mean, this was published by Reuters and UPS. And it made a surprising statement. It said the sun's diameter appears to have been decreasing by about one-tenth percent per century. Scientists have been watching for over a hundred years, and the evidence is now conclusive. Every hour, the sun is shrinking by about five feet. Now, of course, five feet an hour isn't much when you consider the sun is nearly a million miles in diameter. And actually, it's 840,000 miles. But what are the implications here? If the sun is shrinking one-tenth percent per century, then it totals one percent per millennium. Now, if you believe the Earth's age is only 6,000 years, there's no real problem. In that time, the sun would have shrunk by only 6%. But what you have to contend with if you believe in billions of years is something more profound. Because if the sun existed only 100,000 years ago, it would have been double its present diameter. And only 20 million years ago, the surface of the sun would be touching the earth. Now, as far as researchers can tell, this rate of shrinkage has been consistent since the origin of the sun. But astronomers also admit that stars much larger than the present size of our sun burn hotter and faster than our sun. And from the pure, simple evidence, it is clear that life would have been totally impossible on Earth even one million years ago. Just a million years ago, the sun would have been so big and so hot, life on the planet wouldn't have been possible. And yet, they're talking about <clears throat> hundreds of millions of years ago for the age of fishes. Now, let's wake up and smell the coffee here. <clears throat> this isn't my refutation of evolutionary philosophy. These are their words, and out of their own mouths do they condemn themselves. Number two, oil deposit pressure. What happens when oil well drillers hit a pocket of oil deep in the earth? Well, frequently a gusher goes pouring into the air because of the tremendous pressure trapped below in these sedimentary rocks. Now let's think for a minute. 
Even the most dense sedimentary rocks have some degree of porosity in them. With time, what would happen to all of the oil pressure? Well, naturally, it would dissipate. And the time that it would take is measured in thousands of years, not millions of years. Findings have revealed tremendous pressures in very deep oil wells. If those oil deposits had been there for more than 5,000 years, in some cases, there would be no pressure left. The only objective explanation is that these oil deposits were suddenly and catastrophically encased in these flood producing layers, which were laid down just a few thousand years ago in Noah's flood. All right, let me flip over here to page 11, and we see interplanetary dust. Remember when the astronauts went to the moon? And they were expecting dust 54 feet deep on the moon when they landed, which is why they built the lunar lander the way they did. Okay. Well, did you realize that our Earth is regularly gathering dust from outer space? Well, so is the moon. And here on Earth, the dust is hardly detectable. Even so, we should expect millions of tons of it has washed into the sea over the last few billion years. But when we look, we don't find any. Now, since the moon has no erosion, but is also accumulating cosmic dust at a regular rate, we should discover something. At present rates, NASA experts were expecting a tremendous layer of dust on the moon due to its four and a half to five billion year supposed age. Well, the most conservative estimates were expecting 54 feet of dust on the moon. Now, can you imagine landing in a flour sack that deep? Well, what a surprise when men did finally land on the moon. They found only one eighth of an inch to as much as three inches of dust on the moon. That much would have taken fewer than 8,000 years to stack up. So then is it possible that maybe the moon really hasn't been there any longer than 8,000 years? Tuck that one away in your heart. Nobody talks about it, do they? Over here on page 19 is a story called Juvenile Water. Well, what is juvenile water? Well, when volcanoes erupt here on planet Earth, as much as 20% of the erupted material that comes out is water. This water has come from deep beneath the crust of the Earth where being under very high pressure, its temperature was extremely hot. This water soars into the atmosphere as steam and soon condenses down as rain. This water has never been on the surface of the earth before, and that's why it's called juvenile water. And every time another volcano erupts, there is more water being added to the oceans, water that has never been there before. So let's think about the implications of this. Let's do some arithmetic. What information can be gained from a process like this to tell us something about the beginning of things? How long would it take for all of the ocean water of the world to accumulate from volcanic emissions all by themselves? Now, scientists have been observing volcanoes erupting at the rate of about a dozen each year. Altogether, it's been estimated that their total output of juvenile water amounts to roughly one cubic mile. Now, by using simple arithmetic, we can now easily calculate backwards to find out how long it would take to produce all of the present water on planet Earth. So how much water fills all of the oceans and lakes and streams today on planet Earth? And the answer is, 340 million cubic miles. So now we can figure it out. 
at the rate of one new cubic mile of water being added each year, it would take 340 million years to account for all of the water that we now see on the surface of the earth. So what's the implication of this? Well, based upon just this one method alone, the logical conclusion is that there were no oceans at all on planet Earth 340 million years ago. But wait a minute. According to the traditional evolutionary chart of Earth's history, 340 million years ago was smack in the middle of the age of fishes. So now do you see the problem? Now keep in mind that the popular idea of the origin of life assumes that the oceans were essentially full of water at least two billion years ago. So while we're being told the oceans were full of water two billion years ago and evolutionary processes developed what we see today over this long period of time. Either <clears throat> one, that's false, or two, the oceans would be double or triple or quadruple the size that they are today. And the earth would be totally inundated with water. So <clears throat> the one or the other isn't true. So again, I say, out of their own mouths have they condemned themselves. Now, <clears throat> there's another factor that comes into play here called erosion. <clears throat> Now, when we consider the present rate of erosion tearing down the world's land mass and filling into the oceans, the indications of continental geography show that past ages of erosion were much greater than today's rate of erosion. But let's forget that, <clears throat> and let's just use, out of evolution's own mouth, their own words against them. They tell us that everything that we're witnessing today has been what they call steady state, uniformitarianism, that goes back into time. And that the Grand Canyon was formed by the Colorado River chewing out one inch per century, which is about what they figure it's chewing out today. And they just count back in time and say, see this big canyon, this big hole in the earth that was ground out over a long period of time. And Genesis 1 and 2 are totally false. This is called uniformitarianism now. Now, the indications of con uh, continental geography show that these past rates of erosion were higher in the past. But let's forget higher in the past. But even so, at the present rate of erosion, there should have accumulated at least 30 times more sediment in the ocean than there is today. Now, of course, this is based on the assumption that the ocean has been there for at least a billion years, which we just found out not couldn't have been there a billion years ago. The numbers don't add up. So if there's one thing we can say for evolution, they can't count. Now, even more surprising is the discovery that all of the continents on Earth would be worn down to sea level in just 14 million years. But there's no evidence for such drastic erosion. The mountains and valleys on Earth appear to have been very recently made. Their sharp, angular appearance testifies to their youthfulness. Think about that. Take a look at the pictures of the Andes. Those are sharp peaks. Those haven't been worn down yet. Over time, they would wear down, like the Appalachians and the Ozarks. How come they haven't worn down? And what about the Himalayas? Now, there's another factor over here <clears throat> called topsoil. <clears throat> One writer observed that the soil which sustains life lies in a thin layer of an average depth of 7 or 8 inches over the face of the earth. The earth beneath it is as dead and sterile as the moon. That thin film of soil is all that stands between man and extinction. So how long does it take for topsoil to accumulate? Well, scientists estimate that the combination of plant growth and bacterial decay 
along with erosion, produces about 6 inches of topsoil in 5,000 to 20,000 years. So if the Earth has been going on about the same as it is today for millions of years, one wonders why there isn't a whole lot more topsoil than there really is today. So maybe this is just another sign that the Earth hasn't been here all that long. So now, when I went to ag school, what they showed us was that one inch of topsoil builds up in a forest environment in about 90 years. So if we took the Amazon Basin, or we took the forested areas of, say, British Columbia or the western United States, trees grow up, <coughs> they, through their root system and then carbolic acid, tear down the inorganic rock converted into organic wood. The tree grows, it dies, it falls on the ground, the insects and the microbes tear it down. And when it is finally disintegrated, it becomes organic material. We call that topsoil. One inch every 90 years. So if in 90 years you get one inch, how long would it take for us to get a foot? Well, 90 times 12 gives us a thousand and eighty years. So about every millennium it builds up about a foot. Well now here over the Ozarks we had about two feet of topsoil going back about two thousand years as the trees were developing here and the forest developed. It produced about two feet of topsoil. There are places in Iowa where the topsoil is six feet deep. There are other places in the world where it's even deeper than that. But again, just giving 90 years is a rough estimate for the buildup of an inch. Well then, how much topsoil would there be if we had a million years? Well, if you get a foot every thousand years, well, how many thousands fit into a million? So, if we were to take the one million, divide that by the one thousand, and we'd get a thousand, wouldn't we? You know, in a forest environment, there should be a thousand feet of topsoil in a million years. But we note that it isn't that way, is it? Now, I'm not making these numbers, but let me say it again. You know, out of their own mouths, these evolutionists condemn themselves. Now let's take a look at Niagara Falls. You know this famous waterfall is a magnificent example of a geologic clock that reveals a very young earth. Because the rim of the falls is wearing back at a known rate every year. Geologists recognize that it has only taken about 5,000 years to erode from its original precipice. Now coral reefs you know, the buildup of the calcium carbonate uh, remains of marine creatures in the warm oceans of our world could be accounted for entirely in a few thousand years since the worldwide flood. And what about stalactite growth in caves? If you've ever toured in a limestone cave, you're likely told that the formations of dripping stone developed very slowly over a period of more than a thousand years. Now, what's the evidence? Well, under the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., there's a cave, and the stalactites have grown to five feet in less than 50 years. Other evidence shows that cave formations could be easily accounted for in tens of thousands of years at the most not millions. So again, when we go into these caves, in, invariably they will say, well, over thousands, no, no, over millions and millions of years these caves have developed. When we go back to the flood account, Genesis 6, 7, and 8, tuck this one away in your heart. The fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the water gushed out from under the earth. And when the water gushed out, where did it come out? Well, it came out through these caves, boys and girls. Wake up. Let's smell the coffee here. So when you look at Carlsbad Cavern, what you're looking at, and these caved 
um, there's a there's a cave system in the Appalachian Mountains that runs all the way down to the south. I think it's something like uh, twelve or thirteen hundred miles long. These cave systems are all over the world, <clears throat> and all over the world, when the water that was under the earth broke forth in the great flood, it made these caves. This is the channel that the water took when it came out to the surface of the earth. That's what we're looking at. And in the last three or four thousand years, that occurred in 2369 B.C., according to the chronology in the scriptures. We're talking about four thousand years, <clears throat> which is which is just about right. When you take a look at those stalactite growths, they looked about four thousand years old. Because when we measure their growth today, and we can do that, and we have been, we're surprised at how fast they grow. But because of evolutionary philosophy, you know, we all went to school, we immediately think, oh my God, this must have taken millions of years until we actually start looking and counting. So now remember, the sun is burning up at five feet an hour. Oil deposit pressure is high. Interplanetary dust isn't very deep. Juvenile water would account for all the water in the oceans in just 340 million years at one cubic mile a year. And yet they tell us the age of fishes was one to two billion years ago. Erosion, the entire earth would be wore down as flat as a billiard ball in 14 million years. We'll go back 14 million years ago. Is the earth flat as a billiard ball today? I should say it isn't. And the topsoil? If we had topsoil buildup the way we see it today, going on for millions of years, why, we'd have a thousand feet of topsoil sitting on top of the Rocky Mountains today. In the, in the forest regions around the world, we would have a thousand feet in just a million years. Now, boys and girls, when we take a look at the numbers and we do the arithmetic, and then we apply the science science. You know, when you're measuring the consumption of the sun, that's science. That's something that you can do in the laboratory. The guy that does it in the United States can also do it in Russia or South Africa or any place else in the world. That's science. Millions and billions of years is philosophy. That's what I believe. The world is flat. All right, let's go on to another one here. When we take a look at uh, igneous crustal buildup. You know, with a dozen volcanoes a year on Earth now, there is steady addition of new igneous rock. There is more volcanic activity on the ocean floor that we can't even measure. But the observation of our geography shows that there have been times in the past of much more intense volcanism. Conservatively speaking, looking at the statistics, the entire crust of planet Earth could have developed without any other process beside volcanism in only 500 million years. Now, could the land have been missing in the Cambrian period? Or is it possible that the dry land was created a relatively short time ago? You know, when we do the arithmetic to these scientific disciplines, and you say, well, how much, you know, how much volcanism is going on? <clears throat> right now, today, in, I in Iceland, there are islands being built up out of the ocean, land that never existed before. Same thing in Hawaii. As the volcano spews out more and more lava, it adds, you know, a square mile of land here and there every so many years. And as that process continues on, if you just carried that back three, four hundred million years, we would account for, and remember these guys are telling us now, they're, they're telling us that what you see today is what's been going on for the last 300, 400 million or billion or 2 billion years. They totally discount catastrophism. That doesn't occur. That's out of their lexicon. They don't talk about catastrophes. Hey, I'm just, I'm just a reporter. Creation was a catastrophe, and Noah's flood was a catastrophe. Those two events account for the geology that we see in the world today. 
but evolutionary philosophy does not. The numbers don't add up, and out of their own mouths they condemn themselves. And let me give you a reminder here that you're listening to The Law Hour and Editorial Review. We're sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, The Law Hour is heard seven days a week here in the United States, and we're heard around the world in more than 120 countries daily over the Internet and radio. If you'd like more information about The Law School and The Law Hour, then please go to our website. That's georgegordon.org. The law school teaches family law, tax law, courtroom strategy and procedure, business law, agricultural law, civil rights, and biblical law from the scriptural perspective. Now, that's eight schools in all. The law school is a private, non-commercial, non-profit, non-sectarian law school. It is open to individuals, but by prearrangement. Now, the law school conducts a homeschooling program for adults and compact disc, and the Law Hour website is updated weekly. And it has our radio log schedule and archives, and all of that can be accessed through our website at georgegordon.org. All of these Law Hour programs are archived on the Internet by title and date for your listening convenience, and the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. Now, the law school offers a free four-hour introductory CD package. So be sure to order yours by calling the law school at 417-273-4967. Now, once more, that's area code 417-273-4967. Now, if you're online, go to our website, georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. And then uh, click on the archives page, and you can download that free general law CD package right there off our website. Now, the sources of information that we use on this program are true, accurate, and correct, to the best of our knowledge and belief, and the Law Hour and Editorial Review gives credit to those authors and publications that we use on this program. And we often endorse or recommend books, papers, periodicals, and newsletters to our listeners. Now, these endorsements, these recommendations that we give, don't mean that the authors or publications that we're endorsing are necessarily going to reciprocate. Keep in mind that most of these authors and publications that we cite here on the Law Hour and Editorial Review, they may be hostile, political, religious, economic, sectarian, racial, or ethnic partisans, and their viewpoints may not be totally endorsed by the Law Hour and Editorial Review either. Now, these opinions, beliefs, comments, views, and expressions that you hear on this program are mine and mine alone, and they don't necessarily represent the views, beliefs, or the opinions of the advertisers, the sponsors, the management, or the staff of this radio network or of this local radio station. So if you'd like more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, please go to our website. That's georgegordon.org. georgegordon.org or call us direct at 417-273-4967. All right, we are reviewing the book, Modern Science and the Genesis Record, published by, let's see who put this thing out. That might be a help, but I kind of doubt it. <clears throat> You're probably not going to find this thing for any modern publisher. It was uh, <clears throat> the Byrne Witness Company, Byrne, Indiana, 1945. I've never heard of the Byrne Publishing Company before. Copyright 1937 by Research Science Bureau Incorporated, printed in USA, 13th edition. Harry Rimmer, DD, SCD. He's a doctor of divinity and a scientist at the same time. All right, go to uh, bravenewbookstore.com, I think is probably uh, the number... uh, One source, number two source would be your local uh, used bookstore. Tell them to put that into their computer database and see if they can find you a copy someplace. If you want to be able to disprove evolutionary philosophy, if you want to be able to prove scientifically Genesis 1 and 2, most people don't care one way or the other. So for those that don't care, it's not relevant. But for those of you that do, then this is the book for you. It's not the only book on the subject, but it's a powerful good one. All right, so after igneous crustal buildup, let's see what else we've got here. Let's take a look here at trees. You know, what's the oldest living thing on planet Earth? 
Well, most of us have heard about the antiquity of the giant redwood trees out in California. These massive living towers have grown up to more than 300 feet tall. Some of them were already 2,000 years old when Jesus Christ ministered in ancient Galilee. But there are other plants alive today which date back even further. The twisted and weather-beaten bristlecone pine trees cling stubbornly to life on one of the most hostile environments on earth, at least where any life can exist. In the White Mountains bordering California and Nevada, high in the arid desert region, these rare and rugged trees have been growing for about 5,000 years. Their annual growth rings have been studied to give a reasonably accurate idea for their beginnings. Because of the hardiness of this bristlecone pine tree, it's fair to say that they will likely go on living for additional thousands of years, bearing or barring any cat catastrophe that would remove them. So the question arises then logically, why don't we find a grove of these trees somewhere in the world dating back to 8,000 years or 10 or 15,000 years? If trees like this have lived 5,000 years, they could have certainly lived longer. Now it's almost as though all of these trees were planted on a virgin earth less than 5,000 years ago. Now the scripture gives a clear historical record pointing to the global flood about 5,000 years ago when the entire earth was desolated and it stands to reason why the trees of the greatest longevity would date back only to that time and no further back. Now population studies come into play. <clears throat> you know we study populations of nations. We we take a census every once in a while and count people. And then we can mathematically calculate what the growth rate is going to be. For instance, today the world has about 6.5 billion people. And they estimate that in a few years it will have 7. And then they estimate that those 7 billion people will multiply to 14 billion over a certain period of time. And well, those, those population studies are pretty scientific and they're pretty accurate. One of the most revealing clocks deals with the growth of Earth's population down through time. Dr. Henry Morris brilliantly addresses the subject in his book, Scientific Creationism, which is highly recommended. Consider the following facts that Dr. Morris has gathered. Think. If a man has been on Earth for a million years, why is population explosion only recently becoming a problem? Today, worldwide, families average 3.6 children. Annual population grows 2% a year. Here's another fact. The present population would have been developed from a single family in just 4,000 years if the growth rate were reduced to only one half percent per year or about an average of only two and a half children per family. Now that is a fourth of the present rate of growth. It would easily allow for long periods of no growth due to famines and wars. So what does the evolutionary framework have to offer? Well with a supposed million year history of man there would have been an incredible 25,000 generations at 40 years each. Even more incredible, the final total of people amounts to only one or a present population of under 5 billion. Well now, does this fit the statistical facts? How big would the population be now if it increased only one half percent per year for a million years? In other words, we would be insisting there be only 2.5 children per family for 25,000 consecutive generations. And the result, the population would be present or represented by the number 10 with 2,100 zeros after it. Now obviously that is impossible since tiny electrons numbering 10 with 130 zeros following would still be enough to fill the entire universe. 
So if a million years of man's history produced only the present population, how many people would have lived and died in all of that time? It would have been at least 3,000 a billion. You know, that's at least a couple of dozen graves for every acre on earth. But ancient bones are extremely rare. And it seems that the facts line up directly with the biblical model. The Bible model fits with what we see out here in the real world. If evolution were true, then we take a look at population and they tell us, say, listen, no catastrophes, no worldwide floods that come along and wipe out the entire population of the world. The evolutionists say, no, no, we can't have that. So you go back 4,000 years and you just take a lower population increase than we're having today. And it would be more than enough to account for the population we have today. But when we go to evolution and we apply the numbers again, just, just do the arithmetic out of their own mouths, do they condemn themselves? Now there's a thing here called the magnetic field. <clears throat> The magnetic field is deteriorating. The phenomenon on Earth that makes directional compasses point to the north and south poles can tell us something about the Earth's age. Like everything else in the universe, the principle of progressive deterioration, which is called the second law of thermodynamics, is in operation here, too. Physicist Thomas Barnes points out that the Earth's magnetic field has been decaying regularly since it was first measured in 1835. If the half-life of the magnetic field is truly what Dr. Barnes has shown from careful measurements, the conclusion then is this. Earth's magnetic field would have been equal to that of a magnetic star as little as 10,000 years ago. And according to Dr. Barnes, to be consistent with the laws of physics, and assuming the magnetic field has continually weakened, we can only conclude that life on Earth would not have been possible more than 10,000 years ago. Now, the last time I saw a number on the magnetic field, it decreases by 50%, by half, every 840 years. 840 years ago, the magnetic field was twice as strong as it is today. 840 years before that, it was twice as strong again, and so on back. Now, here's another interesting fact. This magnetic field is absolutely essential for life on planet Earth. Now, up on Mars, there's no magnetic field. They've been up there, and they're took some measurements and discovered there's no magnetic field. Well, now, isn't that just real special? But we have one here on planet Earth, and it's decreasing by half every 800 years or so. So 800 years from now, the magnetic field will be half as strong as it is today. 800 years after that, it'll be, eight, it'll be one half as strong again, and so on down the line. Which, again, going back to the laws of thermodynamics, tells us that we're living in a world like a clock that's been wound up. We don't know how powerful this magnetic field was when it was created. We can calculate it based upon what we see today. But here's the reality of life. Was the magnetic field stronger before Noah's flood? Was it as strong as it was before the flood, after the flood? Has it always been decaying at the rate of 50% every 840 years? Or was there a time in the past when it decayed at half that rate or a fourth that rate? Or double that rate or triple that rate? We don't know. We weren't there. And those are called assumptions. Or in law, we say that is assuming facts, not in evidence. So when evolution says, for instance, that uniformitarianism, what we're witnessing today is what's been going on for the last million years, that's assuming facts that aren't in evidence. 
as I've shown you here, scientifically, when we look at the facts, when we apply the numbers, when we look at the arithmetic, the world couldn't have been here. Just looking at the, 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 the consumption of the sun at five feet an hour, the, the earth couldn't have been here three, four hundred million years ago. Just 20 million years ago, at five feet an hour, the sun would have been 93 million miles in diameter which is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So time after time after time, I just picked out 13 disciplines here, and I read them off to you. <clears throat> that tell you very plainly when you do the arithmetic, and this magnetic field here is another one of them. If you went back 10,000 years and kept doubling the magnetic field for, for, for 10,000 years, based upon what we're observing today, Life would not have been possible on this planet 10,000 years ago. And yet evolutionists are telling us, oh no, we've had life on this planet for millions and millions of years. Now there's an affidavit out here written by a guy that we call God. And he says, no, it hadn't been here millions and millions of years. It's been here about 6,000. In fact, in the scripture, God is very careful with time. And he calculates a generation at 40 years. Now today we do... 20 years as a generation. In the Bible, it's 40. And if you take Queen Elizabeth's genealogy, which she can do, and then there's a few others of us that can do the same thing. Going back to the British Israel Society, they can trace their genealogy back to Adam and Eve through the Scripture. And I've had students do that. They come in here to class, they get into it, and they go back and they take the they take the scriptural account and they take their genealogy right back to Adam and Eve. That's fairly common. If you can trace your genealogy back to any of the royal families of Europe, any royal family, there is an institution called the uh, British Israel Society, number one Buckingham Gate, last address I had on, in London, England. goes back to Charlemagne in the 8th century. And they've been keeping the genealogical records of the of the royal families. They don't, they don't do it for us commoners out here now, but for the royal families they do. And those royal families can trace themselves back to the scripture and from the scripture back to Adam and Eve. And those genealogies are kept in the scripture. So if you're wondering what's the importance of all these genealogies in the scriptures, it's so that you can identify your family tree. You can prove the Bible is true, accurate, and correct by more than just science. And your genealogy will do that also. But leaving that out, just to give you a little illustration here, and that traces us back about, about uh, 84 generations to Moses at 40 years age. Boys and girls, we haven't been here for millions and millions of years. And then we didn't come from green slime in a primordial sea. Let's take a look at another one over here. After we get through here now with the, <clears throat> the magnetic field, we've got dissolved minerals in the ocean. <clears throat> As worldwide erosion processes continue, there's a wide variety of minerals that are dissolved and carried by the rivers into the oceans. Now, the densities of these dissolved minerals is slightly increasing every day. Now, because the amounts of these materials can be measured in the river waters and in the oceans, an equation can be calculated to give us an idea of how long it would take at the present rates, using uniformitarian geology now, just uniformitarianism. You take a look at the dissolved minerals that are in the Amazon River. Then you calculate how much water is in the river and running out into the ocean. And you take a look at the oceans and calculate the size of it. And then you take a look at the dissolved minerals in the ocean. Compare that with the dissolved minerals in the ocean, I mean in the rivers. And they come to a conclusion. They say, well, now if this was to continue on like this, here's how many dissolved, or here's the volume, or here's the density of these dissolved minerals will be in the oceans in a thousand years, a million years, and we can extrapolate that backwards and say, well, how long has this process been going on? And again, when we do the numbers, 
when we do the numbers. You find out, well, how long did it take for the dissolved minerals in the oceans to develop? Now, because the amounts of these materials can be measured in the river waters and in the oceans, we can calculate how long it would take at present rates for each of these elements to reach their present densities in the oceans. Now, of all of the minerals and compounds found in the sea, none of their present concentrations require the assumed evolutionary age for the ocean. The evidence does not suggest the elements have precipitated out of solution. The only conclusion is, is that the oceans are relatively young. Now there's a thing here called atmospheric helium. <clears throat> atmospheric helium. Helium is, is, is uh, collecting in our atmosphere. And we can measure it. Surprisingly, we can measure these things. So here's atmospheric helium. The light gas helium used to fill balloons is steadily gathering in the outer reaches of our atmosphere. Now the total amount there can be measured. And one of the sources for it is the constant measurable decay of uranium here on Earth. Now if Earth is billions of years old, the atmosphere would be saturated with helium to such a degree that there would be up to a million times more helium out in the atmosphere there today than we have now. Some have suggested that the helium must be escaping into outer space, but actually such escape is impossible. And the indication is that even more helium is being steadily added from the sun. Now, according to some experts, the helium clock insists that the Earth cannot be more than 10,000 years old today. That's called the helium clock. All right, what else have we got here? Population studies, magnetic field, atmospheric helium. When we take a look at these scientific disciplines and we analyze them, is evolution scientific? You know, these guys tell us that they're scientists. We, we are evolutionists, and we rely upon science. And the Bible is unscientific, they assure us. Well, <clears throat> I asked the question, is, sci is evolution scientific? And no matter how you look at it, the theory of evolution must trace back to a point where inanimate matter came or became a living form. Think about that for a moment. If you look at evolutionary philosophy, there was a time on planet Earth when there was no life. And so they assure us that life spontaneously generated in a primordial soup in the sea. Okay. When did that happen? Well, it was millions and millions of years ago. Okay. This is your story now, partner. Now, when we take a look at the processes that are going on today, in which you evolutionists assure us, all of us dumb truck drivers now, all of us dumb plumbers, you assure us, is guided by the principle of uniformitarianism. That what we're witnessing today is exactly what's been going on for millions and millions of years. And so those of us that got out of the third grade now are able to count this up. All, 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 the, all the math that you people need out there to do this arithmetic is third grade. Third grade. And most of you people have been to high school. I mean, hell, if you got out of high school, you should be able to do this, at least with the help of your Sharp EL1197 G3 Texas Instruments calculator. That's all I've got. I think I paid 70 bucks for it. Now listen to this. <clears throat> These guys tell us that unknown chemicals in a primordial past, through unknown processes which no longer exist, have produced unknown life forms which are not to be found, but could, through unknown reproduction methods, 
spawn new life. In an unknown atmospheric composition. In an unknown oceanic soup complex. At an unknown time and place. But they assure us that this has in fact occurred. Now is it any wonder why many scientists like Dr. Henry Morris who proposed the above idea insist that evolution does not even constitute a bona fide scientific theory. Hey, listen to this again. Unknown chemicals in the primordial past, through unknown processes which no longer exist, produced unknown life forms which are not to be found, but could through unknown reproduction methods spawn new life, in an unknown atmospheric composition, in an unknown oceanic soup complex, at an unknown time and place. And they tell us that this is science? Not by any stretch of your imagination can this be stretched into science. Science is where you measure the sun is shrinking. Science is where you measure the oil deposit pressure. Science is where you measure interplanetary dust accumulation. Science is where you measure the juvenile water coming out of volcanoes. Science is where you measure the erosion that's actually going on. Science is where you measure the accumulation of topsoil. Science is where you measure the wearing back of Niagara Falls. Science is where you measure the amount of volcanic crustal buildup. Science is where you measure tree rings. Science is where you measure the arithmetic and population studies. Science is where you measure the magnetic field. Science is where you measure the dissolved minerals in the ocean. Science is where you measure the atmospheric helium. You know, science isn't bad, and science is knowledge. Science is what we can see, hear, taste, touch, and feel. But unknown chemicals in the primordial past through unknown processes which no longer exist, produced unknown life forms, which are not to be found, but could through unknown reproduction methods spawn new life in an unknown atmospheric composition, in an unknown oceanic soup complex, at an unknown time and unknown place, doesn't have anything to do with science. It has to do with philosophy. That's even dumber than religion. And I can't think of very much more that goes on around us than is dumber than religion. Can you? Now, the book you're looking for here is called Modern Science and the Genesis Record. It's written by a fellow named Harry Rimmer. <coughs> Harry Rimmer. Remember, you want to go to bravenewbookstore.com. They're in Austin, Texas. Or you can go to your local used bookstore and plug in this title. It's called Modern Science and the Genesis Record by Dr. Harry Rimmer. And I think if you do that, you'll find a copy of it out there someplace. Again, that's uh, The Modern Science and the Genesis Record by Harry Rimmer. Hey, we're running out of time. Let me give you a final reminder here that you have been listening to the Law Hour and Editorial Review and that we're sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. The Law Hour is heard seven days a week here in the United States, and we're heard around the world in more than 120 countries daily over the Internet and radio. If you'd like more information about the Law School and the Law Hour, please go to our website. That's georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. The law school is a private, non-commercial, non-profit, non-sectarian law school, and it is open to individuals, but by prearrangement. The law school conducts a homeschooling program for adults on Compact Disc, and the Law Hour website is updated weekly, and it has our radio log schedule and archives, and all of it can be accessed through our website at georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. 
All of these Law Hour programs are archived on the Internet by title and date for your listening convenience, and the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. All right, I'm out of time. I've got to leave it right there. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Same time, same station. God willing, of course. So until then, thanks for listening, everybody, and good night, friends.